Well, good morning. So I've been working my way through the book, <clears throat> doing Imago Relationship ther Therapy and the Space Between. And the first, uh, what I've looked at was the first part of the book was about meta theory, sorry, the theory behind <clears throat> Imago Relationship Therapy. Now, the next section of the book is, uh, is a, a called uh, Imago Clinical Theory, which is still sort of the background. Uh, it's not clinical practice yet, but it's the theory behind. And it looks at life, therapy, and relationships in this new quantum universe of ours. What's that going to look like? So chapter three, which I'll talk about today, or part of it, uh, begins with a look at our complex human brain and its role in the drama of couplehood. And obviously the authors don't pretend to provide more than an introduction to the history of our interest in the brain, which probably stretches back a couple, almost 3,000 years. But their conclusions from what neuroscientists tell us about the brain today will say something like this. Our brains were shaped by our interaction with our caretakers. That environmentally shaped brain shows up in adulthood and determines the quality of all relationships, especially intimate ones. Our relationships will sustain or change the operation of our brains for better or worse. And since our brains are plastic, changeable, we can use our relationships to change our brain. So we'll uh, try to explain all that. So in explaining the workings of the brain, <clears throat> the general trend is to think of the structure of the brain as including the lower brain, the central brain, and the upper brain. And contemporary neuroscientists would agree that those structures um, of the brain have functions native to them, but they're not static, uh, which challenges an older view of the brain, which would limit certain functions to certain regions of the brain. Rather, today, neuroscientists would say there's a distribution of func functions throughout the brain, both recognizing the brain's complexity and its capacity to change, neuroplasticity. You know, we, we just know the brain is much more plastic than, say, even 25, 50 years ago. Uh, we, it it uh, can create new neural pathways. So in other words, the brain is not a static machine, but a dynamic, living, adapting, growing organism in constant interaction with its environment. Now, they go on to say that, you know, we might talk about the brain and the body as being separate entities, but they are as interconnected and interdependent as our fingers are with our hands and as we are with the universe. The brain and the body are in constant communication, sending messages back and forth to adjust and readjust the feedback they produce and upon which both are dependent for their balanced homeostatic functioning. Think about it. For example, the body knows, even before the higher brain processes it, whether someone who's walking a little too closely behind us is dangerous or not. We have, to, you know, we have that intuition or that gut feeling. But given all this, <laughs> the different parts of the brains uh, <coughs> do have functions particular to them. Now, I'll look at the lower and midbrain today, and, and look at the upper brain next week. Now, again, realize that. What we know from neuroscience is it's much more fluid, much more plastic than we originally thought. But it's always in the lower brain is always in communication with other parts of the brain. But its primary function of the lower primal brain is to ensure our physical survival. The lower brain, they go on to say, is hardwired for survival and is programmed to ensure the organism's safety. It operates automatically as if on autopilot requiring no conscious input put input from the upper brain. What drives the lower brain, first and foremost, is the irresistible power of the survival directive. That is, the compulsion to stay alive. That's the lower brain. The central or midbrain, known as a mammalian or limbic brain, developed later. Evolved mammals with this newer portion of the brain, like cats and elephants and humans, nurture their young, for example, whereas snakes and crocodiles don't. So as we've evolved, this lower brain, we all have, but then the mammalian brain, you know, it's a seat of emotions, things like that. Now, the central and lower brain are generally lumped together as the old brain, and it tends to classify incoming stimuli as something that's either safe or dangerous. Safe simply means something that will not hurt, harm, or kill us, and dangerous, of course, means it's precisely the opposite. Now, here's the important, uh, one of the important parts. Note that the threat of hurt, harm, or kill 
may be conveyed to the primitive brain even when the harm is only emotional, not physical. So the authors go on. Keep in mind, these self-defenses were are evolutionary and finely honed to work in the wild. Yet they tend to be just as operative in our civilized world, even when there is no objective danger. But perception is everything. And if the primal brain perceives something as dangerous, no matter what it really is, it's dangerous. The imagination is as powerful as, if not more powerful than experience. And that, to me, is the crux of the problem. If your old brain senses danger, it will defend itself, period. That's 500 million years. You're not going to change that. But here's a challenge for you. Think about how relationships are often depicted in our culture. TV, movies, those magazines at the checkout counter, but in real life. But think about it from your old brain point of view. If I attack you or yell at you or don't talk or shut down or make fun of you, what are you going to do except defend yourself? You see it everywhere. And all I'm saying, all I'm saying doesn't work. All right? Why? Because it doesn't feel safe. Your old brain senses danger, and it's going to go into survival mode. Fight, flight, or freeze. So if you want a great relationship, you're going to have to learn to your, talk to your partner in a safe way. And that's where we'll get into it in Chapter 9 about the safe communication process. But safety is the key. So I know we're, you know, uh, this is all fairly theoretical, but it, it just, they're going to say that, look, at this, this, this is what neuroscientists tell us about our brain. Uh, we have to pay attention to that. And so safety is going to be a key to any great relationship. Okay, so next week we'll look at sort of the, the more evolved brain, the uh, cerebral cortex part, and, and try to make some connections and conclusions from all that. All right, so see you next week. Thanks for watching.